Hello and welcome everyone to our webinar, which is dedicated to exploring intergender opposition in the Asia Pacific region. Um, we will wait for a couple of minutes to let the rest of the people who have signed up to join. Okay, I hope everyone who has signed up has already joined. If not, we'll have a whole hour in, in, uh, in front of us. So I hope they will be able to catch us. So welcome everyone again to our webinar. As I said, this webinar is dedicated to exploring intergender position in the Asia Pacific region. And this is a part of the series of webinars that Gate has been hosting which has been exploring intergender opposition in different parts of the world. Our last webinar was um, focused on intergender opposition to trans and gender diverse communities in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And in this webinar, we will be discussing um, intergender opposition to trans and gender diverse communities in the rest of Asia and the uh, Pacific region. And we have really interesting and outstanding panelists who have a lot of wisdom and experience in these areas. And I will introduce them one by one. But I just wanted to tell you that to our um, um, attendees um, uh, that you will have an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, uh, and our panelists will, I will um, read out loud your questions and you can use um, Zoom's Q&A um, uh, feature to send us the questions and towards the end of uh, our uh, webinar, I will ask, uh, I'll read out loud your questions. So first, initially, I would like to turn to Manisha. Uh, Manisha is, uh, Manisha Dagal is a transgender LGBTI rights activist from Kathmandu. Thanks for being here, Manisha. Uh, she has been involved in Nepal's LGBTI rights movement since 2001 through different projects on HIV AIDS, human rights activism, constitutional campaigns, capacity building and academic research. Uh, Manisha is one of the founding members of the Asia Pacific Transgender Network, where she represents South Asia. She is also one of the co-chairs of ILGA Asia Board and a board member of IRGT, a global network for trans women and HIV. Manisha was awarded the Nairam Lakshmi National Award in 2010 for her contributions to the LGBT movement in Nepal. Uh, and she was involved in court pleadings on behalf of LGBT people before the Supreme Court of Nepal in a case which led to a landmark verdict directing the government to enact laws enabling equal rights for LGBT citizens. So uh, Manisha, I wanted 
first, can just to open up the discussion, can you please briefly give us an overview of the main trends, which includes like the main narratives as well as the tactics and um, issues that anti-gender movements are using and basing their uh, strategy on in Nepal against trans and gender diverse communities? Thank you, thank you, Liva. That's the uh, did in the society, and people still consider gender means you know, women and girls, and men and women, and stakeholder unitary programs and strategies. And there is a service settings. stigma and discrimination and on the other hand transgender women as women and transgender men as men so they want to put the transgender men and women first for the third category and non-binary option and so i say anti-gender movement terms is new challenges for the community of nepal and many uh, community people activists and the community who are working in different community based organizations in local level uh, they know the they are suffering and they are facing the challenges from the pre-existing stigma and uh they couldn't differentiate what is the pre-existing stigma and uh, what is the anti-gender movement so uh this pre-existing stigma which is also very much harmful for us. You know, there is a possibility of supporting those actors who have negative thoughts towards the subjects community through the anti-gender movement and the risks of possible connection of the anti-gender movement and the actors of pre who created the uh, pre-existing stigma. So with the effort of the, for, I would like to give the one example that is happening in the Pakistan right now with the effort of the trans in the Pakistan, you know, the trans protection bill 2018 was passed, but recently it is challenged by the federal Sharia court, which is religious court, and in the parliament, and there is a huge uh, anti-trans movement is going on in Pakistani media, so which creates a threat against the transgender community at risk and a threat using the religion of card. So what this indicate is uh, we now are global citizen and injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere and people are searching for the excuse and they can be easily influenced, you know, the, our policymaker, our government and our actors are easily influenced by the others what is happening in the region. So it is very dangerous. So we uh, are facing uh, challenges uh, from within the community that we cannot differentiate what is anti-gender movement and what is the pre-existing stigma. So we need to build up that community. I'll talk uh, later on about this. Thank you. Um, thanks, Manisha. Could you also give us an overview of um, your experience and your knowledge on how trans and gender diverse communities in Nepal, uh, maybe also elsewhere, are um, how, how they're impacted, but also like how they're counteracting this anti-gender narratives. Like maybe you know some creative ways or like some effective ways that trans and gender diverse communities have done to counteract this anti-gender position they're facing. Yeah, uh, we have lots of, you know, the uh, negative comments in the social media. Uh, well, uh, someone posting some, you know, the uh, issues related to the transgender community and there's lots of negative uh, comments in the social media that we are facing. And because of the social media comments, it's impact on the mental health among the, uh, uh, our community. And it creates, you know, the, the negative 
thoughts against the transgender people and whole Sojay's community in the society. And that is happening, that I give the example of the Pakistan right now. And while uh, considering the Pakistan case, you know, that I knew some activists who are displaced from the Pakistan and to the another country. So I supposed to go to the Pakistan for our, our regional project assessment, but seeing this incident, you know, the, our plan has been canceled. So it's in fact our activism and there is a possibility of further, you know, the delayed on the laws and provision. And while seeing the Pakistan case, it can be happening to any part of the world and the people can be influenced by each other that I mentioned and the uh, stress displacement, mental health issues, withdrawal, any achievement and remorse in media, challenges in activism, which impact the entire challenges to access the rights of transgender people. And if something happened, what we are doing is, you know, we bring this issue strongly because the trans community, Sojax community in Nepal are very vibrant and very vocal. And we bring these issues in the media, in the court as well. And we complain these issues in the uh, police as well. And then National Human Rights Commission is closely, very closely working with us and mobilize our community. If something happened, then we mobilize the community. Uh, in the grassroots level as we are working in the very grassroots level and uh, one important thing is media uh, making the media allies is very much important so uh, in the beginning of our activism we are closely working with media and in the difficult part also we uh, connect with those media who are already allies of uh, our activism so we are doing this kind of you know the appro approaching at the state level with the National Human Rights Commission government and the, uh, you know, the uh, police and then mobilization of our own community, our grass level community at the local level and with support from the our stakeholders and the uh, stakeholders and the support from the media, which is very, very important that we are doing. Okay, thank you, Manisha. And I, I was just wondering how effective this process has been. Like, is the media actually support? Have you been able to find supportive, <coughs> sorry, media outlets? And has the media coverage been improving in the last? Improving, yes, it's improving. Uh, in our initial uh, movement, it was uh, some what extend the negative in the 20 years back when we compare. Now it's uh, improving. Now media is using the correct terminology and now they are start to differentiate with sex, gender, sexuality, gender identity, and gender expression uh, before it mix, uh, yeah, mix up, you know, the sexual orientation, gender identity, and it's clogged the whole transgender term with the whole LGBT and the whole third gender term uh, to address the whole transgender people, which is totally wrong. Now media is, you know, they're trying to to uh, use the correct terminology, correct word and correct phrase. Uh, and uh, now they are consulting with us also. Uh, now there are some progressing and uh, we are uh, continuously working with the orientation, skill building uh, classes, knowledge building sessions with the media, media houses, so that the media fellowship program also, so that, uh, you know, the, we use uh, those, you know, the, our, uh, media allies during this difficult if something happened uh, we uh, mobilize the media allies as well uh, i'd like to give some example like uh, there is a rape case against transgender after rape she was murdered and we uh, you know the police could uh, at that time we wanted to complain the file of the rape and the police uh, couldn't taking the file because the rape is only uh, in their view, in their thoughts, rape happened on, against uh, the uh, women. So we mobilized media, we mobilized National Human Rights Commission after the uh, huge media campaign, you know, the police force, the, you know, the, the uh, asset of complaint. And now, after two years of that, what happened? Uh, the uh, victim's family after two years recently, the Bagmati province uh, government with the compensation uh, to the victim's family. So uh, media mobilization is uh, very much important. And, uh, you know, the, uh, we need to be very crucial that uh, to uh, work from, from our beginning, from our initial movement uh, to working with media.
that is very much important where they are very supportive but in case of pakistan what happened is you know the uh, the anti gender movement used the media to spread the rumors to spread the negative thoughts to uh, against the um, transgender and the whole lgbtiq community and it is very dangerous yeah thanks manisha i will come back to you towards the end with more questions. And now I would like to move to Dr. Aligra Walter. Uh, Dr. Walter, her pronouns are she, her, and she, uh, she's a trans physician with five years of diverse leadership uh, experience in medicine, community advocacy, health technology, research and education. She currently serves in Swarakita Advisory Board as a chairwoman an organization focusing on LGBT plus rights in Indonesia. Uh, Dr. Walter was known publicly for her community work focusing on multiple mental and sexual health campaigns, particularly within the spectrum of SOGS, HIV and LGBTIQ plus health. So Dr. Walter, um, I would like to ask you the similar questions to you and for you to give us a similar overview of the situation in your context. So what would be the main narratives and issues that anti-gender movements are using against trans and gender diverse communities in the context of Indonesia? Thank you so much for the question, Levan and Manisha for sharing before and maybe uh, Madura uh, for our next speaker. Uh, thank you, Gate, as well, for inviting us together uh, this lovely afternoon. Uh, I think in general, uh, we could say that in a lot of global South countries, we are going more conservative in some areas. Uh, sharing from the context of Indonesia, uh, the last decade, I must say, uh, there are lots of conservative movements happening in this country. And uh, it is reflected by the Sharia law uh, and Sharia inspired regulations that came. So if you uh, might know, Indonesia is a, the most populous uh, Muslim majority country, but we are not a Sharia or like a Muslim country per se. We are a democratic country with uh, Islam as the majority of the religion but we recognize other uh religion as well catholic christianism buddhism uh hinduism and so forth uh but over the last uh, decade we see more sharia inspired regulations so initially only in aceh there is uh has a because in in several areas they have their own jurisdiction to determine their own uh law for that area so aceh is Sharia completely. But uh, over the past uh, decade, we can see that there are Sharia inspired regulations that is reflected in a lot of formal and informal policies happening uh, in our country. For example, like the uh, mandatory hijab uh, usage for school girls. And uh, I think uh, over the past one or two years, the new Ministry of Education implies that there is shouldn't be uh, there shouldn't be like a mandatory hijab usage. Uh, he's part of the more progressive uh, generation as the Ministry of Education, uh, but at the same time the implementation might vary in several different regions. Because when we see about conservatism, it is not only about uh, the written rules, but it is also the unspoken rules that happen in our society. Uh, when a little girl, they don't want to wear hijab, uh, they can be taunted by their friends. Uh, your parents will go to hell if you don't wear hijab. And those kind of uh, narrative that are happening. And this happened to the general population. In regards to specific to gender and sexual minorities, uh, Ever since 2016, 2017, we see uh, LGBT crackdown, I must say, well, when it comes to uh, the human rights aspect, uh, there are lots of regressions. So not only for women's rights and also human uh, rights in general, but uh, also specifically for LGBTIQ plus uh, population itself. Uh, 
we see more regulations coming up from the government. They they want to criminalize uh, cohabitation and also uh, basically sex with without marriage, which of course uh, gay marriage or same sex relations are not uh, recognized by the government, which automatically be included as uh, a, uh, as a penalty, if uh, as a crime, basically to to love someone and do consensual sex, and uh, I think it was supposed to be uh, legalized in twenty twenty in the middle of the pandemic because the legislative bodies are not opening that much uh, on the information, but thankfully because of the media highlighting that. It became it created a massive upheaval in Indonesia. If you read news somewhere in 2020, you'll see that we have the the biggest demonstration ever. I think uh, over the last years, uh, and it was happening protesting against that. Uh, it, we call it RKUHP. Basically, it is a compilation of several different laws uh, that are some of them, most of them are a little bit absurd. For example, like the cohabitation law and also uh, some form of uh, press violations as well in which you cannot say or criticize the government, which is freedom of expression and freedom of press uh, that they are being halted. And also the cohabitation, the living law, violation of uh, living together, but uh, if you are not married per se, or doing uh, consensual uh, sexual activities, and also some regression regarding our, our own corruption law, which is quite problematic. And uh, since that massive demonstration, it was being postponed, but I heard that the, the, the narrative will be open for discussion again, by the end of this year. So we will see uh, how much uh, the that the media will cover it this time. Uh, because in general, I think that although the Indonesian political system uh, sometimes do not represent the needs of the many, but they are in a way quite, uh, they listen more to the majority of the voices. So if we see lots of demonstrations, lots of backlash, they might postpone that or change the law in a way. Uh, so at this point, we will see that if, it, if, if it's coming up, then definitely we need to have more, uh, not only dialogue anymore, but more of a demonstration at a point uh, that will highlight the aspect and the articles in the in the upcoming law that doesn't cater to the needs of people basically so uh we see as a trend i think we see lots of progression in human rights in women's rights uh rights for freedom and also uh lgbtiq plus uh definitely and uh as you can see that uh there's a lot of LGBTIQ plus crackdown happening in Indonesia, and we see this visibly uh, in a lot of the uh, regulations that we have. Although it is not legalized nationally, but several areas in Indonesia, they create a law that will ban LGBT plus people in general, straightforward uh, doing consensual sexual activities. And we also have uh, the Indonesia do have pornographic law, some which sometimes they can use that and tweak that law to criminalize uh, gay uh, gay couples or gay people in general who are having sex in their own personal spaces, like in sauna, for example, uh, which also a violation of human rights. And uh, at the same time we see that there is a link between the the upheaval of uh, anti-LGBTIQ plus and LGBTIQ uh, plus uh, human rights crackdown with the health issues, uh, especially during this first uh, came up to the public. I think it was in 2017 and 2000, 
18. I still remember some of my colleagues in Puskesmas, it is our primary health facilities. They ask whether uh, being gay, is it normal or am I having a disorder or am I sick because I'm gay? And they uh, and prior to that, they never uh, thought about themselves being sick at all because of the media uh, and some of the conservative medias especially, and also conservative leaders, including experts as well. Uh, there are people, there are physicians and also psychologists doing conversion therapy actively in Indonesia. And you can imagine that they don't follow the, the right uh, medical guideline in general. And uh, it, it creates a lot of distress for the community, definitely. Yeah, that's very interesting. And as I see, some of the actors of anti-gender movements are in the state. So <laughs> there are state actors initiating certain legislative changes. But they're also like, is there religious authorities as well? And media, I think. And But there are, are there also like social movements who are also anti-gender and far-right groups, for example? <laughs> yes. So uniquely, uh... I think it was, I first heard about the, like a uh, Indonesian or basically the Indonesian name is Alia, uh, like the family, uh, they, uh, like they want to focus on the idea of conservative family. That's basically the, the, the idea of their movement. And uh, ironically, they do have their members spread it out in several uh, universities, several uh, institutions, uh, government institutions. So they are experts and educated people and sometimes scientific people as well, which is an irony. Uh, we, we are seeing more trends. I think uh, this is uh, like overall opinion per se. It is not a evidence-based research, but we see uh, that there are people who, who came from scientific backgrounds and turn, they turn out to be more dogmatized and more conservative compared to those who came from social background. Because I think in Indonesia, there, there is a bit of separation in that, in terms of education system. And uh, we see the, the rising conservative uh, agenda in education as well, uh, in terms of uh, limiting freedom of speech. There are universities who actively ban LGBTQ plus topic to be brought up in university so there is no form of uh you know if if you want to go for higher education i think the ultimate thing that you want to pursue is critical thinking right which is not happening a lot of dogmatization actually happened and these are happening in some universities like in some parts of sumatra and some parts of java and in, uh, indonesia in general uh and uh, these are happening in higher institutions. So it is, I would say it's a bit structured and uh, it is quite uh, difficult to map them one by one because uh, they do have followers. They do have uh, their own academic uh, titles and everything. They do have uh, their uh, people protecting them on their back. And uh, in a way that, uh if there is a regulation that started to become more more, more and more conservatives actually the, those who suffer more will be uh, the minorities and women uh, who are in marginalized position like economically disadvantaged uh and there are agendas as well for every election year LGBTQ plus topic will be brought on to the public as some sort of political tool for political parties to use against the other parties. So if your party has some sort of indication that you support human rights in general, you will get backlash. So therefore, I think in we don't have that much of allies in the government. So if you see Western media, mostly you have the far right and also the far left which uh, I think in the Indonesian politics, I don't see that duality. We see most of them on the far right spectrum, uh, but maybe there are people who are in the gray areas. 
like they uh, didn't actively spoke against it, but actually they they okay. They even have family members who are uh, part of the community and uh, they're quite progressive in general, but never use their voice actively. And uh, but at the same time, I do see lots of more awareness coming from the feminist movement in Indonesia, feminist and intersectional movements really. Uh, that includes LGBTQ+, people with uh, disability, physical or mental uh, conditions, uh, and also uh, people with different uh, ethnicity and background, because Indonesia is quite diverse. You have the Malayu-looking, Chinese-looking, Eurasian-looking, Indian-looking, and a Melanesian, like a, a well, not Aboriginal, but the Mal Melanesian uh, were darker skin tone and you know in the eastern part of Indonesia and there are more awareness to that uh, and but at the same time it is not I feel like it is not touching the the higher position enough although we see that uh, there, there are lots of investment coming to the gender movement in Indonesia but if you see the gender movement for example like in business it will be very normative like only indonesian women who are usually ethnically coming from java are you looking and muslim as well and uh they came from privileged background which is not touching the other uh subgroups of the society so that's the idea of gender is including only women but only the white women but indonesian version of white women uh and yeah, but at the same time, uh, I think that it is not good for us to only focus on uh, those narrative. Like it is much more productive if we can focus on what are the things that uh, we can work on. Because I do believe that there are the far right people and there are people who are in the gray area. And if we can support these people to speak up and uh, for them to become the champion, minimum for their own friends and family members, uh, it will be a lot of tremendous help. We need more allies, definitely. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Walter. And you touched upon this already a bit, but I would like to ask you again to um, explore more. So what is the current situation of trans and gender diverse communities or like activist communities even at this moment, like how they're impacted? Are they strong? Are they getting weaker? Or like, what is the situation? And if you know any of like really impactful ways that trans activists and gender diverse activist communities are resisting this opposition that other activists around the world could learn from. Yes, uh, definitely that. Uh, I have to say that a lot of uh, the movement for to transgender people in Indonesia are quite program based in a way that uh, a lot of people coming from uh, the, the NGO background, they are middle class or sometimes lower middle uh, condition. So they, uh, they work in NGOs. They are mostly powered by a certain prog uh, international or even sometimes national uh, program. Um, if it, it's in healthcare, usually it is under HIV umbrella. Uh, as you can imagine, like it is still the 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 only part one the only program in Indonesia that recognized trans women only in HIV, and uh, the activism are mostly within the healthcare spectrum. But I see, I think the the last since two thousand seventeen, I uh, as well. I think the last five years there are more programs that are focusing on uh, human rights. Uh, and that includes the uh, crisis response mechanism, which I think APTN is also part of uh, with several uh, national level uh, network, uh, which they try to report the human rights abuse with the U UN uh, mechanism. Uh, and I think that is a good thing that we have that. And also uh, the... Indonesian LBH as well supporting us. LBH is a organized civil uh, legal legal support organization which support uh, any uh, misconduct and uh, any law aspect freely to the community. Uh, 
uh, and as a community in general, I see more activists coming from the Gen X generation Y millennial uh, population, uh, which were much more empowered and uh, more educated, uh, formally educated, sorry, compared to the previous generations. The previous generations, uh, they are mostly uh, within the HIV sector when it comes to uh, NGO work. Uh, but at the same time, there are scholars as well. Uh, some people were openly gay, uh, serving as a university lecturer per se. Uh, but there are not much of us. Like there are several actors, uh, but uh, we need basically more support, not only from the organizational and NGO spectrum, but from the more general public and also from uh, public and private sectors, from companies as well. And uh, I, I think uh, what we can support as a organization uh, network in general is to, to continue the empowerment projects, uh, capacity building and linking up uh, these organizations. If there are uh, other things that uh, we can highlight, especially when it comes to uh, law and regulation, which uh, will become more and more conservative. I think uh, there should be a way that we can collectively collaborate with other democratic movements to oppose that. Because uh, there is no way that uh, in Indonesia, we don't have that much of power in terms of if only LGBTQ plus community, but if we combine with Komnas Perempuan, uh, the female Komnas, Komisi Nasional, uh, the, the female bodies basically in Indonesia uh, and also other uh, organizations as well, we can definitely create like a more substantial impact and we can stand up there as part of the gender and sexual minority, which is already like a huge uh, population itself uh, within the movement. So definitely collaborating with other uh, democratic organizations uh, will be ideal. And uh, we often create statements. I think uh, over the past pandemic, we create statements regarding COVID-19. Uh, we publicly share that. And uh, there are lots of uh, some uh, pop culture issue happening in Indonesia. Uh, I think one, for example, one of the Indonesian famous influencer, uh, they give uh, like a homeless trans woman uh, what's supposed to be food, but they give rocks inside of that. And it creates a, a, a lot of public uh, hate towards that influencer. And uh, I think that uh, generating those kind of humanistic uh, approach in terms of getting the public to, to know that we are human and uh, uh, to highlight the stories, it's also a good idea. I think uh, that what I can say, I think it's part of the networking capacity building. And I think if, if there is a way that we can locate uh, some focal points and also like a, like a champion for different parts of areas, it, it will be wonderful as well. Because that is what I see right now in Indonesia. They uh, sometimes try to, uh, lift up several stories like we know uh, Bunda Mayora for example from eastern part of Indonesia from Maumere in Nusa Tenggara next to Bali uh, she is she used to be a pastor but now she she works as the first uh, people working in the government bodies uh, in in her local area first trans woman to do so in in her area and I think uh, highlighting uh, those uh, champion can definitely highlight different narratives to the issue. Uh, thank you, Dr. Walter. And finally, um, I would like to move to Madura, who is a, a and I will come back to you, Dr. Walter, by the end of this webinar. Um, so Madura is, uh, their pronouns are they and them. Um, they're non-binary queer feminist activists who work with um, and for social justice movements across Asia <coughs> at the um, Asia Pacific 
transgender network. They're currently focusing on building intersectional movements and combating anti-gender movements, particularly in regional advocacy spaces. So just because Madura, you're representing an organization that works on a regional um, scale, I will, I will, my question will also be directed in that regard. So I would like to give, um, I would like you to give us an overview of what does the anti-gender opposition landscape look in the whole region? And if you know um, where do these movements and these forces, the anti-gender forces, get their financial or ideological support from? Is it Russia? Is it the West? Is it the local? Is it, I don't know, what, whatever. Where do they get this influence from and support? Thanks, Levan. Thanks for uh, inviting me. And uh, thanks to Manisha and Allegra for a very informative um, discussion. But as you can tell from what they have said, um, you know, uh, being based in two Asian countries in two different subregions, the reality is very different. It's very difficult to generalize uh, in Asia and the Pacific, given the subregional diversity and the diversity of um, you know, the vast uh, ethno-linguistic groups, the religions, etc. But that being said, uh, I would say um, that, you know, we need to bring maybe a little bit more of a nuance in how we use the term anti-gender in context of Asia and the Pacific. Uh, I think um, the hallmark of Global North anti-gender movement is not necessarily applicable in the same way uh, in, in, in the region. So what I mean by that is, um, uh, I guess the starting point uh, of that sort of anti-gender sentiment is um, challenging that, you know, gender, uh, the idea of gender, but also like the idea of fixity in, in a binary, patriarchal, cisnormative, heteronormative system. And, um, you know, in Asia and the Pacific, we have a lot of legacy of not having these sort of uh, binary understanding necessarily, um, which have been lost in some cases irrevocably because of a long legacy of colonization where a lot of our present policies uh, are actually imposed and a lot of our present attitudes also, I mean, not in their entirety, I'm not trying to say that nobody was ever stigmatized for a gender diverse identity, are um, also part of that colonial legacy. And it's, in a sense, it's ironic, I feel that it's easier to, you know, um, knowing like real time what uh, famous or whatever infamous gender critical feminist sitting in UK or USA is writing on Twitter, but it's much more difficult for a uh, trans activist sitting in Indonesia to connect with a trans activist sitting in uh, Central Asia and to sort of discover our mutual realities. Uh, so in a sense, I feel that imperialistic legacy is continuing where, um, the sort of global north narrative is in a sense reinforced and that becomes the norm. So yeah, I would a little bit like to also tweak our understanding of anti-gender movement because I don't think necessarily a parallel in that what Allegra was saying that there is the far right, but there is also a huge chunk of liberal feminist identified cis women who are uh, sort of making very transphobic comments or or are sort of basically saying women's rights are being violated by trans rights. I do not think that there's necessarily a parallel to that in the region. Uh, and largely what we see um, is that it is sort of, I mean, there is a, a gradual move across the region towards more right-wing uh, sort of, uh, and more authoritarian, more surveillance prone, uh sort of less uh citizens freedoms and rights and violations of human rights across board not just for lgbt people not just for trans and gender diverse people um and in these regimes just as manisha mentioned the the most striking one is probably 
I can think of the case in Pakistan where the 2018 law, the Transgender Rights Bill, was one of the most progressive anywhere in the world. And now it's being challenged in the Sharia court. And then you also have cases from Malaysia of this conversion therapy app, which is endorsed by the government. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it is even when it's coming from institutions like the government or it's through certain policies, it has a religious tinge to it, I think, a fundamentalist ideology behind it. But again, this is not uniformly applicable, I feel, in case of India, for instance. I mean, it is there to some extent, but at the same time, the passing of the trans rights bill, which is flawed as a lot of trans activists have pointed out, or uh, the decriminalization of same sex consensual relationships, uh, which is a colonial legacy, um, the right wing government, which is very anti uh, sort of, which is very pro sort of a very, um, a uh, strong ideology of what a Hindu man should be and who are the aggressors, etc., um, is now celebrating in, in a sort of uh, in certain fora. It's being celebrated as a progressive and sort of a pink washing attempt to say that we are accepting of, uh, you know, queer or LGBT people and trans people, etc. Um, so, uh, which then again brings us to the questions of intersectionality, as Allegra was saying, and Manisha was also saying, um, that ultimately the worst off people are the ones who are vulnerable, not just because they're trans, but are also, it's compounded by sort of other uh, sort of intersecting identities, whether because they're sex workers, whether they're uh, working class people, and so on and so forth. So I think that's a very important lens uh, to keep in mind. And Therefore, I think it's also uh, important to note, I, I don't think the anti-gender movements are cross-regionally as organized as in Global North or in Latin America. Uh, and they do not have a single source of funding necessarily, and it's often diverse and from diverse impulses. But what I'll say is, again, because of the primacy of uh, the news or the discourse that is formed in the global north, I'm increasingly seeing uh, the sort of, particularly uh, the sort of gender critical feminist ideologies are to some extent, I would say influencing, or that is my fear. I think they will become more and more influential and they will influence. So far, uh, I don't see a lot of that. Uh, at least very openly, but yeah, I mean, I think it is being solidified in language uh, sometimes where, uh, you know, even advocacy groups are using very binary, like women and girls sort of language, and it's becoming difficult to challenge that where you, yeah. So uh, yeah, that, that's the answer. It's not very, I'm sorry, it's not very particular because it's a, very vast and very diverse region. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, am, I mean, I understand. And thanks for pointing out some of the decolonial criticism against even the term that is not, might not be applicable in a region um, that might be applicable in another setting like in the global north. So thanks for pointing that out. Um, and I wanted to also ask you like, because you work with so many organizations, so many activists in the whole, um, in, in, in these regions, um, probably you have, an, you have access to information on how activists are resisting this opposition that um, activists watching currently uh, could learn from and could replicate in the, the, and, and, and adapt in their own settings. So maybe you can give us uh, um, some of the examples that activists have used to um, counteract this uh, anti-gender opposition. Yeah, again, I think it's very context specific uh, because in a lot of countries, actually, you do have some like like particularly in South Asian countries, you do have now some laws recognizing trans rights, but at the same time, or the constitution in Fiji, for instance, is the only constitution in the world to uh, sort of uh, recognize hate, hate crimes 
gender expression, uh, hate crimes on the basis of gender expression as a category of hate crimes. But the problem remains that even where there are actual policies uh, or rulings like the recent rulings and declaration, both in Indonesia and Vietnam, that sort of ban conversion therapy, uh, it's, the change on the ground is much slower. Um, and uh, the stigma, as Manisha mentioned, is continuous. It's like pre-existing any sort of consolidation of anti-gender movements, whether or not they're happening within the country. So uh, often, uh, and, and also I really want to make this point that uh, I believe from a regional perspective, having worked with, uh, you know, women's organizations and uh, trans rights organizations that I believe the trans movements in Asia Pacific are like by a huge margin, very poorly resourced compared to all other social justice movements. And uh, what Allegra was mentioning about, you know, project-based or programmatic or health-based, those are often the only avenues left for activists because that is where the funding is coming from. So this is, again, like the criticism of uh, philanthropy and uh, like, which is also has a sort of colonial legacies coming from the global north to the global south. And um, in that, we do not see like poor, flexible, movement-oriented funding for trans community-based movements. So um, it's, it's really often um, a story of grit and determination in the face of like surmounting odds. And the one thing that, keeps coming to my mind when I think of this is, you know, the organizing in the face of COVID where, uh, you know, trans people across the region were nowhere on the government's priorities. Um, uh, and uh, the community mobilized for the community. And it just shows that uh, trans people are able to take care of themselves. They just, they just need financial resources. They don't need external intervention to tell them what to do and so on. And a lot of these uh, communities that we have worked with or we continue to work with and who did organize sort of community-based monitoring, uh, community-based sort of relief and uh, sort of organizing in the face of complete policy indifference and lacune or active harm in certain cases because criminalization of homeless trans people, criminalization of trans people, sex workers, just uh, increased manifold uh, in like, uh, not even a misguided, I would say like a, a mischievous sort of uh, mal intent to discriminate against trans people during the pandemic. Um, um, so, uh, and, um, Therefore, uh, this was this was really extraordinary, in my opinion, that trans people, trans communities were able to mobilize uh, so much resources, not just not just financial resources or food or relief, but um, mental health support, for instance, or access to uh, medical needs that uh, like gender affirming care that trans people have that again, was deprioritized during the pandemic by the government uh, in face of you know, vaccines or COVID treatment, et cetera. So access to hormones, for instance, um, um, access to shelter because people were often caught in very abusive uh, sort of family situations in lockdowns. So providing mental health support, providing that sort of community-based support amidst lockdown, uh, amidst uh, lot of uh, stigma and discrimination uh, amidst loss of income uh, and so on is like, it's really for me uh, the highlight of how uh, activists and trans activists and how their spirit is like so resilient and uh, amazing really, yeah. Yes, thank you very much. And my final question would be to all of you, and I know you can choose whoever um, will answer to answer this question. So I was wondering from your perspective, what is in, in the nearest future, in the foreseeable future, what is needed to counteract this anti-gender opposition that we, that we have been speaking about 
and for the trans communities in your context to thrive and to be more successful, like what needs to be done? And please try to just imagine that maybe donors or activists or international media or other organizations are listening to you. So what no, so not only speak of what local activists need to do, but also like from the perspective of donors, what international media, what other state institutions need to do to um, for the trans communities to be able to thrive. Maybe you can start with Manisha. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, then, uh, I would say, uh, you know, honestly, that this discourse is not happening in my country. Like uh, we are more focused on as Madura medicine, HIV, it's intervention program. And we are focused on the health sector stigma and discrimination and service sector stigma. But this discourse of anti-gender movement is so honestly, I'm speaking the community activists, CBUs, they don't know. And uh, we are confused that whether it is, uh, you know, the uh, pre-existing stigma, uh, and anti, it is the impact of the anti-gender, you know, the movement. So uh, the knowledge building on and bringing the, these issues in the discourse within the community-based organization, within the activists is so important. We need that one. And another is the specific funding, uh, you know, the targeting for the transgender and the gender diverse community to counteract so if something happened, then we need to address, we need to support our brothers and sisters uh, who are facing the threats, uh, you know, the stigma, discrimination, security concerns, mental health issues uh, because of this movement. So we uh, need a funding on the specific on those areas so important. And as I mentioned, and in Nepal, you know, the working with community, uh, I'm uh, talking about my own country that working uh, with the uh, media is uh, not a problem. So uh, we already have some uh, allies with the media. So in, we can mobilize media in that situation. So uh, working with media is also so important. And uh, many uh, people that I uh, give the example that well, one of the uh, activists from the Pakistan this place and now sees in another country. So that kind of concern, we need to take care uh, of the activists who displace from the anti-gender uh, movement and uh, the, you know, the regular, so, you know, supporting each other and the regional solidarity as we are in the Asia Pacific region, there is a transgender network at the Asia Pacific level, uh, solidarity and raising the voices and the awareness is very, much important and mobilizing the human rights commission is because the human rights commission in different countries are working on behalf of the rights of the different minorities people. And in case of Nepal, they are supportive. So working with the human rights commission is also, we need uh, that kind of interventions. And uh, we need to identify and differentiate what uh, who are the actors uh, anti-gender movement and so that we can uh, set the strategy uh, to prevent uh, you know the from their activism in our activism so we need to identify we need to map out who are those actors uh, who involved in the anti-gender movement so that we can prevent them to connect with our you know the allies our government our uh, you know the policy makers so uh, that is very important then I would say Thanks, Manisha. Dr. Walter, would you like to continue? Thank you, Levan. Please call me Allegra. <laughs> okay, I will. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and I think I uh, adding to what Manisha said before, uh, when it comes to anti-gender opposition, I think that in general, the Indonesian population are not very aware of what is gender, which is like a social construct. And even if they do uh, are aware of the concept of gender, sometimes they adapt like a very conservative or cis heteronormative way of viewing gender. So definitely uh, we need more discourse and also uh, the educational aspect 
not only uh, but not only stopping at the educational but we need more empathetic approach uh, in this movement because uh, there is no way that uh, we can educate uh, without allowing the general population to recognize uh, that we are in this together in this journey because gender journey is not only a journey for a transgender population in general not only for trans people but also for the general population because they are navigating their own gender they're questioning uh, whether they want to be a stay-at-home stay mother or a career woman for example and uh, it is important to highlight that in uh, our advocacy so it became more re relatable to people in general and i think that uh, over the past years i see lots of improvements in uh, in media and also lots of criticism from the feminists and younger generations of uh, productive age uh, women men and also other uh, gender minorities uh, when it comes to capturing issues for example uh, on rape issues uh, in the past, we might see some captions that uh, is quite problematic in a way that uh, it emphasizes uh, raping someone uh, as some sort of macho stereotype into that. And uh, we're seeing more criticisms. Uh, that's only one example. Uh, and a, a lot of media personnel nowadays are starting to become more aware uh, on certain issues, especially those who are working uh, in international media, which also cover stories in Bahasa, in Indonesian language as well. So it can easily be uh, more digested. And uh, there are lots of trainings happening for uh, media people as well in terms of in inclusive language and asking the right people for the right questions. Uh, that includes asking like a LGBTIQ plus inclusive healthcare professionals about uh, LGBT health, for example, and not asking the far left conservatives that you know would encourage uh, conversion therapy, for example. And for international uh, organizations in general, I think what uh, Madura said as well, I think it's quite important to have flexible uh, funding and also support which not only uh, which should transcend beyond uh, HIV and transcend beyond uh, only the educational aspects. Because with with the COVID nineteen, I think one of the positive side of COVID nineteen, we realized that uh, online is like the new offline. You know, like there, it's much easier to have this kind of conversation. In the past, we might you know uh, hire a venue a venue to create an event. Uh, but now we can convert things uh, online and people are okay with that. I think th there are lots of plus uh, points to that. But at the same time, uh, I don't think that having uh, conversations like this is enough. I think we should translate that to a uh, programmatic approach because uh, no matter how small the program is, if it reaches to the to the people to LGBT people in university, for example, like it can definitely create a huge impact in other people's lives. Uh, that includes uh, in health, in human rights, in education, in employment sector as well. So uh, we definitely cannot work together and uh, only working in limited sectors, but we need to make this gender issue mainstream because this is part of uh, the general population issue as well, because they, they're, they're basically fighting for the uh, similar thing every day uh, when it comes to uh, gender stereotypes and construct. Uh, why men cannot cry, or you know, some men probably don't want to pay for dinner, they, they want to split the bill, those kind of uh, narrative that are happening in the general population. And also for, for trans people, and also trans organizations in general, I think it is quite important to be more active and open because I see right now in Indonesia, those who are coming from a more privileged background, sometimes they don't want to open uh, their status. They want to live themselves in peace, but they, they are specialist doctor, for example, or they are a successful business person. 
and sometimes it is hard to be someone that you never see so uh, you can imagine like a trans person who only see uh, the how some media portrays trans people as a sex worker for example like uh, they don't want to grow up like that for example and i i think that in general uh, we need more different narratives of how trans and gender diverse people are so uh, we see more uh, options and uh, chances for the younger generation to see that they could be no matter what they want to or uh, whatever they want to pursue the only thing that's different is that they have different gender identities and expression uh, and i think uh, that's the 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 importance of being out and open and uh as so uh, encouraging the younger population to know that uh, it's okay to be different you know because i think that i cannot be who i am today if i don't see empowered people like manisha here uh, and also medi and also uh transgender uh advocates uh celebrities or uh you know uh professionals out there who are you know visibly open and being trans at the same time and gender diverse and also uh identifying more donors and funding mechanisms and I think I and I, I agree with uh, what Ma, uh, Madura Medi said before that uh, we need more like flexible funding. Levan, you can imagine that for a trans organization led by like a mid senior trans woman who never had experience navigating English, and they have to write down a bunch of different <laughs> reports in English. It, it will be very hard. Like even for people who have English. Uh, power or English degree whatsoever they still need to read them one by one and uh, I think the, the, the bureaucracy is quite heavy I understand that it is quite crucial to have that because otherwise you know you don't know uh, if your funding is being used the correct way or not but at the same time that we need more linkage in terms of donor and funding uh, to uh, not only to give funding but maybe some sort of like a mentor uh, to the organizations to grow uh, the organization into a situation that they could be financially secure, quote unquote, and also uh, hopefully in the future not really relying 100% on donor. Because that is what uh, we are doing as well in Suara Kita. Uh, the, our founder, Mas Hartoyo, he, he, he has fashion business, for example, uh, that can uh, help us get additional funding we sell used clothes or uh bags uh any other accessories uh per se uh, which also can uh fund our other programs when there is no funding available so i think those kind of uh empowerment is quite crucial and uh not only giving the food but we need you to teach us how to uh how to fish you know <laughs> you know not only giving us the fish but we need uh, we need you know the assistance and technicalities on how to write reports for example how to do research and uh, those kind of things and uh, i think this can be uh, implied as a for some sort of real capacity building and also education I, I always try to encourage the other younger trans people to you know if they if they don't have like certain degree or high school degree or even undergraduate uh, at least or diploma they should get it like because they're young and there are uh, scholarships uh, available and I think that uh, the other organizations whether it's national organizations or uh, international organization like embassies they should help this population because I think it's a uh, it's untouched basically by the government system and even if government system do help support for example in, during the COVID-19 what Mehdi mentioned before yes we do have uh, distributions of money and also some price to uh, marginalized population sometimes it didn't reach the trans and gender diverse people because they are heavily stigmatized and discriminated within their own neighborhood so they don't probably never receive uh, those kind of support as well and also i agree with what manisha uh, the last one probably that uh, other than mapping out the anti-gender actors we should 
map out our allies as well and uh, trying to uh, get them to a degree that they can support us but uh, we we get it in conservative society sometimes they are quite reluctant to be open like oh i support my lgbtiq plus community uh, friends for example uh, but there are things that definitely that they can do uh, there are not uh, in a way that uh, it implies their full support but they are supportive you know for example uh, like uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic we had collaboration with the Kemendagri Ministry of Home Affairs to help uh, transgender people especially transgender women who doesn't have ID card uh, to smoothen out the process because previously uh, a lot of trans people especially trans women who are being kick out of their homes early when they were younger, they didn't have ID cards because in Indonesia, the ID card is tied up to the family card, which is, you know, if your family is not supportive, there's no way that you can access that family card. And if you don't have family card, you don't have ID card. So they don't have ID card. And to, uh, they definitely link, need some support to smoothen out the process because some of the administrative uh, officers uh, sometimes and regulatory bodies, uh, they are not aware of the, this intersectional lens of this issue. So uh, uh, it became hard for the trans people to get their ID card. So in that sense that uh, with the support from the ministry, uh, there are supports to that. So they can now get their ID card is much more easily. And the, the officers uh, in certain areas who are aware of this issue, they, they allow the trans communities and trans women, for example, to dress up the way that they want to present in their ID card. Because previously there are in, uh, instances that they have to, ha, uh, to mengunchir, what do you say it in English? Like the, the ponytail to make sure that they look like a man, for example, uh, which is- I have to, Sorry, I have to, can you like wrap it up with a minute, just one minute and we, because yeah. we don't have a lot of time. Thank you. I think that is all. Uh, so the recommendation will be uh, from the media, international organizations, trans people organizations, and also uh, gathering support within the national level from the private and public sector. So if I can add uh, and identifying uh, the inclusive leaders as well. Yeah. Thank you. And Mathura, uh, can you also like wrap it up within like five minutes, please? We're a bit over the time. Yeah, so um, I would say that uh, I would like to start by saying that I do not think that the governments are our allies. So like uh, I don't have that many expectations from the government. And the difficulty is that multilateral spaces uh, where governments and states are held accountable are increasingly taken over by in the global north, like uh, advocacy spaces like the UN are taken over by very strong global north um, anti-gender advocates increasingly. So that's a real um, challenge, I would say. And those spaces should be free from influence of corporates or you know religious authorities or one perspective only. Um, the recommendation to uh, you know donors, for instance, um, again, is related to how I think governments are not our allies necessarily, um, is that um, increasingly there is a lot of restriction on receiving funding across Asia and the Pacific, uh, particularly uh, for, uh, like you know donations from outside the country or uh, you know funding from outside the country and uh, as a response uh, a lot of donors are sticking to you know um giving money maybe to larger organizations international ngos that have local chapters and so on who can uh you know match up with very strict compliances and so on uh and that means that uh actually trans led movements uh which are often grassroots, often unregistered, are uh, left. So yeah, basically, uh, as all of uh, us are saying, it should be flexible, should be core, should be uh, support-based, but at the same time, it has to make that 
extra effort to reach marginalized trans population. It has to focus on funding translate movements and not, you know, larger NGOs who have a HIV program, which also addresses needs of trans people. Um, and um, yeah, I think uh, my biggest appeal is, and, and the biggest strategy I feel uh, to combat anti-gender movement is allyship with larger social, uh, other social justice movements and really uh, focusing on an intersectional lens. I think it's definitely possible uh, with, you know, women's rights movement. I mean, ultimately we're fighting patriarchy. So like, uh, it's really important that we build those allyships regionally, globally, and as well as um, try at the grassroots level to um, sort of make our movements more intersectional and therefore stronger. That's all. Thank you very much for your wise words and for sharing your experiences and your knowledge. I hope to, um, and I'm um, referring now to um, our attendees, I hope this uh, webinar was interesting and we will meet within probably a, a month uh, for our next webinar. But thank you again for um, your attendance and have a good rest of your day. Yeah, I'd like to say that uh, two transgender women are stand for the election in the federal level election coming soon in Nepal. So, and uh, I need some support for them. Uh, so I request all of you to explore this support to candidate transgender women are elect now stand for the election in Nepal. Great, thanks for sharing this Manisha. Okay, so this is this will be the end of our webinar and goodbye. Bye.